Mountain Church of Christ presents Let the Bible Speak, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. glad that you've decided to tune in to the program today. My name is James Malone and I'm the preacher at the Washington Avenue Church of Christ in Jonesboro, Arkansas. I'm encouraged by your interest in hearing the Word of God and your desire to gain a better understanding of His will for you. I hope that you'll take your Bible and open with me today to Matthew chapter 28 as we study together from the Word of God. You might also want to take out a pencil and a piece of paper so you can jot down some notes as we study along today. Now there are many passages throughout the New Testament that describe to us the importance of passing along the good news. We have an amazing story to tell. The gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the privilege of going to God in prayer to ask Him for His help in fulfilling this mission. We have a worldwide mission. And then all of this is made very personal. In other words, God wants to use us. He wants us to be the ones who are willing to speak up on His behalf. And so with these things in mind, 
We want to look together today at the last few verses in the New Testament book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. By the time we get to the end of Matthew's gospel, of course, Jesus has completed around three and a half years of teaching and preaching. He's been crucified. He's just come back from the dead, and now he's getting ready to ascend back into heaven, leaving his apostles to carry out his mission. You know, over in Luke chapter 2, we have the very first words recorded by, that were spoken by Jesus Christ. Where at 12 years old, he tells his earthly parents who had been searching for him for three days, why did you seek me? Don't you know I must be about my father's business? Those are the first words of Jesus Christ while he lived on this earth that we have on record. Today, at the end of Matthew, we have some of the last words that Jesus ever spoke while he was on this earth. A passage that we sometimes refer to as the Great Commission. We might think about parents who are going to be leaving their children with a babysitter for a few days. Maybe they're about to go out of town, but for whatever reason, they're going to leave their children with this babysitter. And as they leave, obviously they're going to have some parting words for them. This is what you need to know. This is what's important. This is what we want you to do while we're gone. And that's the idea here as Jesus sets this mission in place. This is what Jesus wants his people to do while he's gone and until he gets back. Let's look together in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. The Bible says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. For just a few minutes today, I want us to keep our thoughts focused on these very important words as we make some, some observations that we can apply to our situation in Jonesboro, Arkansas, or wherever it is that you may live. Nearly 2,000 years after these words were first spoken. And again, these words are so important. When we look back at this little paragraph, what do we need to know? What do we need to learn? Perhaps what do we need to change? What does this passage mean to us in very practical terms? As we look today at these five verses. One of the first very practical lessons that I believe we can see here is that Jesus wants us to reach out to all people. And this mission starts right where we are. And it starts right now. Nearly all of the commentaries that you can look at on this passage point out something very interesting about the grammar in the opening words of verse 19. In most of our English translations, the main command of the Great Commission appears to be go, as if we're located in one place, and in order for us to fulfill this command, we need to move to another location before we start preaching and teaching as if we need to move from where we are currently living to some other place in order to go out and do what Jesus is commanding for us to do here. As if we need to go from here to there before we begin to do this preaching and this teaching. But the scholars and the language experts, they point out to us that as far as the grammar 
is concerned, the only real command in the Great Commission is to make disciples. And we'll get to this idea of making disciples in just a few minutes. But I want to make sure that we get this here at the beginning. This word, go, at the beginning of verse 19, would probably be more accurately translated as, as you are going, or even having gone. And if we look at it that way, it begins to sort of change the meaning of the Great Commission for us. Having gone into all the world, we are to make disciples of all the people who are around us. And so here we are in Jonesboro, Arkansas, or wherever you live, perhaps thousands of miles from Jerusalem, where this command was first given. And not only that, not only are we separated by distance, but we're also separated by time. Nearly 2,000 years from the first giving of this command. In other words, all of us, if you're watching this program right now, we are the ones who have gone into all the world. We're the ones that Jesus was referring to in verse 19. And now that we've gone out into all the world, our mission is to make disciples. In other words, now that we're here, separated by distance and by time, we are to fulfill the Lord's command by reaching out to all people right here and right now. Having gone, in a sense, from Jerusalem to Jonesboro or from Jerusalem to wherever you live, having gone, this statement applies to us personally. And even very specifically, having gone to work this morning, I am to make disciples of all those who are around me. Having gone to the grocery store, having gone to school, having gone across the street to a friend's house, having gone, I am to make disciples of those people who are around me, wherever it is that I have gone. And when we look at the statistics, we know that this is how the church grows. Several years ago, there was a study conducted that asked new converts, what was the major influence leading you to Christ and to his church? And here's the response. Two percent of those surveyed said that it was some form of church advertising that led them to Christ and to the church. 6% of those surveyed said that it was the preacher who led them to Christ and to the church. Another 6% said it was some organized evangelistic program that played the largest part in leading them to Christ and to the church. But then an overwhelming 86% of those asked said that it was a friend or it was a relative that played the largest part in their life, the largest part in leading them to Christ and to the church. Generally speaking, those of us who are Christians, we weren't converted by a missionary who, who traveled thousands of miles to preach the gospel to us in some kind of special meeting. Generally speaking, we weren't converted by a television program or by an advertisement in the newspaper or by any of these other methods that get so much attention sometimes. But instead, by vast majority, I would imagine that those of us who are Christians most likely were brought to the Lord by our families or by our friends or by our neighbors. Having gone out into the world, someone taught us. And now, having gone out into the world ourselves, we also fulfill the Great Commission by teaching those around us. So first of all, Jesus wants us to reach out to those that we come in contact with. And the mission starts right where we are. The mission starts right here and right now. There's something else that we need to, to get out of this passage. And it goes back to the main command that we see in this text. And that is to make disciples. 
The main point here is that we are to make disciples. And we do this by going, by baptizing, and by teaching in preparing for this lesson. I ran across an article that compares this to a parent telling his child to clean his room. Cleaning the room is the command. And the parent then goes on to tell the child that he will clean his room by vacuuming, by dusting, and by picking up his toys. Those three participles, they explain how cleaning the room is to be carried out in the same way. The main command that Jesus gives us here in this great commission is to make disciples. And he tells us we carry out that command by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. And so what is a disciple? What does that term actually mean? Well, the root of the word disciple, it's also the root of our English word mathematics. And the root word itself refers to being a student. It refers to being a pupil. When we are disciples, when we make disciples, we're making people students of Jesus Christ. We're pointing people to Jesus. We're saying, look, Jesus has something to teach us. Jesus has given us something to study. He's given us something that we need to absorb. As Christians then, we need to be dedicated to teaching the world about Jesus Christ. We need to be dedicated to making disciples. We are to make people followers of Jesus. We teach, we baptize, and we continue teaching. We could go over to Mark's account of the Great Commission and we see this process emphasized. We see the great importance of it. You might keep a finger here in Matthew 28 and flip over to, to Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, notice how important it is that we teach and we baptize. Jesus says there to his apostles, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. How important is it that we make disciples? Our mission has eternal importance. Those who don't believe in Jesus Christ, those who don't become disciples of His, those who are not baptized, Jesus says those people will be condemned. Imagine the shock of facing God in judgment. Someone who has never heard the gospel of Christ. Now imagine that you were that person's friend or neighbor, and you're a Christian. The sentence is handed down to that individual, handed down from God's throne, eternal separation from God because they did not believe and because they did not obey the gospel. Now imagine that person, our friend, our neighbor. Imagine them turning to, to us and, and asking us, why didn't you tell me about this? Why didn't you warn me that this was coming? We went to school together. We cooked out in the backyard together. We went fishing together. Why wouldn't you tell me about this great day of judgment that was coming, that great day of judgment that has now arrived? Why wouldn't you tell me about the importance of belief and repentance and baptism? Sometimes we sing a song about this. When in the better land, before the bar we stand. That bar reference there is a reference to the bar of judgment. Like lawyers must pass the bar or, or the judge asks for a sidebar, the bar of judgment. But the song says, when in the better land, before the bar we stand, how deeply grieved our souls will be. If any lost one there should cry in deep despair, you never mentioned him to me. You never mentioned him to me. You helped me not the light to see. 
You met me day by day and knew I was astray, yet never mentioned him to me. What a horrible, horrible situation that would be. The emphasis in this passage is on making disciples. We're to make people students of Jesus Christ. That's our mission in life. That's our mission as individuals. That's our mission as a church. We're to make people students of Jesus. We're to make disciples. There's something else I want us to notice here in this passage today. That is, there is an emphasis on the Word of God. And we see it in all three parallel accounts of the Great Commission. In Matthew 28 and verse 20, Jesus said that we're to teach people all that He has commanded us. That's a reference to all the words that Jesus spoke over His three and a half years of ministry. Now, by the way, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of the Gospel writers wrote their books of the Bible, and as they wrote those books, they were doing exactly what Jesus had commanded them to do. They wrote the words of Jesus so that those words could be passed down through the generations. And so we see that it is a cycle. We are to teach and we're to baptize. And then we're to teach others to teach others. It's a never-ending cycle. We think about farmers who plant corn. Not all corn is planted to be eaten, but some of it is planted for seed. And that's what we see here. So this is Matthew's account, an emphasis on the Word of God. The disciples were to teach all that the Lord had commanded them. They were to teach the Word of God to others, who were then to go on and teach others, who were then to go on and teach others, and so on we would go. In Mark's account of the Gospel, we have something similar. As Jesus told the apostles to preach the Gospel. Again, as Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 15, which we've already read, He said, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creation. An emphasis on preaching the Gospel. Literally, the Gospel means good news. It's the good news concerning Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Then over in Luke's account, we have a passage that's somewhat parallel to Matthew and Mark. In that passage in Luke chapter 24, verses 45 and 46, the Bible says, And he opened their understanding, that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Another reference to the Word of God. Jesus based the Great Commission on the Word of God. Now there are a thousand gimmicks that we could use to try to manipulate people, to try to trick people into becoming Christians. But the Word of God, the Gospel, that is God's power of salvation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. We, have the, we understand the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, where he says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. That's why when we come together, when we present lessons and sermons from the word of God, we base those exclusively on the Word of God. We're not studying what some person has said about the Word, but we get ourselves into the Word of God itself. We teach and preach. And when we teach and when we preach, we teach and preach the Word of God. So now here at the end, I want to make a suggestion. Over the next week, Let's see if we can keep our eyes open for opportunities for telling someone about Jesus Christ. Most of us obeyed the gospel when we were taught personally by someone in our family or by a close friend or by a neighbor. 
That's what work works. We know that that's what works. And so the message is, let us go out and do more of that. Today we've studied some of the last words of Jesus as he walked on this earth. We learn, first of all, that we can fulfill this great challenge right here where we are, right now. We can do this. It's our responsibility to do this. Secondly, we've learned that our primary mission is to make people students of Jesus Christ, to make them followers of Christ, to make disciples. This happens when people in our lives hear the gospel. When they believe in Jesus, when they repent of their sins, when they confess that they believe He is the Son of God, and they're baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins. And then finally, we've learned today that all of this is based on the Word of God. It's not based on our opinions. It's not based on what we would like to happen but it's based on the Word of God itself. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a disciple, if you're not a student of Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to become one. If you know what you need to do, believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, I want to encourage you to seek out a congregation of God's people in your area and let them know about your desire to become a Christian. I want to thank you for tuning in today. I hope that you've been encouraged by our study together. And I look forward to the next time that we can study together from God's Word. We hope you've enjoyed studying the Bible with us today. We look forward to joining you again next time as we study the truth of God as it is found only in the Bible. If you'd like a free DVD of today's lesson, have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, or would like a copy of the two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ, Post Office Box 2216, Jonesboro, Arkansas, 72402. Email at nettletonch at yahoo.com. Fitly Spoken with David Hayes Profader. During the giving of what we now call the Ten Commandments at Exodus chapter 20, God decreed at verse 14, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Though our proper understanding of that divine decree is the prohibition of the overt act, Jesus recalled our attention to that commandment and issued an additional and equally important admonition that none should lust after another, for to do so is to commit adultery in the heart, even if the physical deed has been avoided. To help us understand how the Lord wishes us to arrive at and abide by this conclusion, you may recall Solomon's wisdom at Proverbs chapter 23, where at verse 7, he observed that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He who lusts does so in his heart. If a man is what he is in heart, then he is an adulterer who lusts after the same in his heart. To understand this is to understand numerous things, including how sin is avoided in the first place, as well as the Lord's meaning when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Today's word fitly spoken. On the resurrection morning when all the dead in Christ shall rise. Raising power ready to 
Saints all shouting, heavenly beauty all around. I'll have a new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. Oh, yes. I'll have a new home, glory, glory to me, where the redeemed ever shall stand. stand. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain, there'll be no more strife. No more strife is praising the likeness of my sight, be ready to live and I'll be glad. I'll have a new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. I'll have a new home, glory, glory, glory to me, where the redeemed ever shall stand. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain, there'll be no more strife. Just praise the like of my life. ready to live. I'll glory. be glad. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord. I'll have a new life. What a glad thought! Some wonderful morning. Just hear Gabriel's trumpet sound. When I wake up, when I wake up to sing no more. Rising to meet my blessed Redeemer with a glad shout. I'll leave the ground. When I wake up, when I wake up to sing no more. When I wake up, summer and morning, to sing no more. Jewels Happy I'll be over in glory on heaven's bright shore. Telling a story with the redeemed of all the ages, praising the one whom I adore. When I wake up, when I wake up to sing no more. Hearing devices. Button. Music recognition. Selected. Screen record.